We're on our second sermon in this short series before Christmas on imputation. And so tonight we're looking at our sins imputed to the Lord Jesus. And that really flows from what we looked at last Sunday evening about Adam's sin being imputed to us. So if anything doesn't make sense or you have any questions, please do <coughs> grab me at the end and, and I'll try and straighten the things out that you might have missed last week. But for now we're going to read this wonderful passage that talks about the Lord Jesus. And I want to pray before we read it. Heavenly Father, we would pray again as, as Tim prayed for help from your Holy Spirit. That before we even come to the, the preaching of your word, you would be speaking to us as we, as we read your word. As we come before you in prayer and as we sing our hymns. Father, we pray that our, our whole service might be an act of worship of you, the living God, of us responding to who you are and what you've done in our lives in thankfulness. But also, Father, we pray for, for blessing and food from heaven. We are weak people and we are lost if we're not fed from your word. So, Father, we pray that you would be with us, that we would know your presence and help in a real tangible way and that we would grow from being here this evening, from being watered by the water of life and from feeding on the bread of life. We pray then for the Lord Jesus, more, more of Jesus, we pray in his name. Amen. Isaiah chapter 53. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living, the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by this knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great. And he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Please open your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, and verse 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 21. Let's pray. Let 
Heavenly God, we thank you that you are the good God. Thank you for your faithfulness to us Sunday evening and Sunday morning after Sunday morning. And speaking to us and dealing with us. Father, we need your help tonight <coughs> as we deal with ideas that are so far out of so far beyond our understanding, far too deep for us to grasp. And yet with your, the help of your Holy Spirit, we may see something of the wonder of the plans of your grace, of them coming to fruition at Calvary, and what that means for us today. Father, we pray that you would indeed speak to us, change our hearts, make us more like our Saviour. We pray for his great glory. Amen. Last week we began our series on imputation. The word imputation means to credit a characteristic to a person. Just turn me down a little bit, Sam. Get a bit of the old fuzzy. There we go. So imputation means to credit a characteristic to a person, to put them in a certain category. And we said that this is crucial because we're talking about the way that God views and deals with us. Last week we dealt with the difficult topic of Adam's sin imputed to all men and women. That when Adam jumped into sin, we jumped with him. And so God has put us with Adam in the category sinners. Now we might complain, we might say it's not fair, but we have no argument to make. Because we prove that God is right in the way that he's judged us. By the things that we do. We sin all the time. Sometimes I sin big. Sometimes I sin small. But every day I have proven that God is absolutely right to put me in the category sinner. My actions witness against me. They prove that I have something wrong at the very core of who I am. I'm not a good person who gets things wrong but I have a sinful nature. Now this is bad news for us, because God has said that anybody who is in the category of sinner is deserving of death <coughs> and hell. And perhaps you think that seems harsh. But imagine a river that's poisoned at its source. What's it good for? It can't do anything that a river should do. It can't support life. It can't give life. It can't water crops. You can't go to it and quench your thirst. If it was polluted at some point, you could clean it. Or just go upstream and find clear water. But if the pollution is at the source, if it is ruined at its source, then it is useless from the spring all the way to the sea. We are like that river. We are rotten at our core. And so the consequences, well, we see those in our actions. Our rotten actions flow from a rotten heart. Our sins flow from a poison source. So we are entirely ruined, just like that river that is good for nothing. It must be abandoned. So God looks at us, and his judgment is death. That is what we saw last week in Adam, all died. All sinners deserve death. And everyone who is in Adam, that is all of us, is a sinner. And so there has never been a person on earth who has not deserved death and hell. Except for one. Because the Lord Jesus was never in Adam. He didn't have a sinful nature who is pure and righteous and holy. But he died. And so we have a question, don't we? If God is indeed just, and if he has power, why didn't he protect his son? Why would he allow Jesus to experience the terror of crucifixion? <laughs> How do we defend the reputation of God 
when he would allow the righteous, innocent Lord Jesus to suffer such a terrible death? Well, there is only one way that we can make sense of what happened at Calvary. And it is imputation. The only way that we can defend the reputation of a loving, merciful God, a just God, the only way that can be maintained is that we understand this verse that we've got right in front of us. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Simple words, aren't they? Simple, simple words. We can all understand them. But Paul is saying something mind-blowing here about Calvary. He's saying in all the injustice and agony of what happened at Golgotha, something was being achieved. As the Lord Jesus died, God was there, imputing our sin, crediting our sin to Christ, and punishing our sins in His Son. God was making His Son answer for our wrong wrongdoing. And Jesus was willingly choosing to have our sins laid on him. So that's what we're thinking about tonight. Our sins imputed to the Lord Jesus at Calvary. There is one question. What really happened at the cross? What was really going on there? And 2 Corinthians 5.21 has four answers to it for us. We're going to break up this verse and just look at parts of it as we go through. The first thing I want you to see tonight is that the cross preaches the innocence of the Lord Jesus. Just take those four words from that verse. Who had no sin. The cross preaches the innocence of the Lord Jesus. Now crucifixion was never intended to demonstrate anybody's innocence. It had three purposes. To embarrass and agonize as a great warning against the enemies of Rome. And to prove unequivocally, un unequivocally that this person was guilty. That's why one crucified criminal could say to the other one, we deserve to be here. We're guilty. There's no denying it. <coughs> but I'm saying to you that the cross is the greatest proof that Jesus was completely sinless. We say, don't we, how could that possibly be the case? How could anybody be sinless in this world with all of its temptations and challenges? How could somebody remain untouched by sin? Surely Jesus had some sin of his own that he picked up along life's road. Well, look at the evidence. Men could find no fault in the Lord Jesus. Before he was executed, the Lord Jesus went through three trials. The first one was an absolute sham. It was conducted in illegal, an illegal place at an illegal time. The judge, the jury, the witnesses, they were all enemies of the Lord Jesus. They brought him to trial to make things look official, but in reality it was no more than a lynch mob. It was led by the, the greatest religious authority in Jerusalem. Their one aim was to accuse the Lord Jesus of something that would lead to the death penalty. And yet they couldn't pin a single thing on him. Doesn't that blow your mind? Think about that. These men have watched the Lord Jesus for three years, looking for something in him that they could pin on him, something that they could accuse him for. And yet at this trial, at this great opportunity to label him as a sinner, not one of them can get anything to stick. His second trial was before King Herod. He sat there and listened to all of the accusations of the scribes. What charges were pressed against the Lord Jesus? No. Instead, the adulterous king of some unwanted corner of Israel sits and jeers and laughs at the innocent king of kings. The third trial was before Pilate. He hadn't met Jesus. He didn't have any agenda or plan. He was the most objective and honest of all of his judges. What did Pilate say? 
I find no basis for a charge against this man. And so you see then, that the testimony of men, even men that wanted to convict the Lord Jesus, was that this man is innocent. From the marbled halls of the Roman governor to the filth of Golgotha, where a criminal could say, don't you see, this man has done nothing wrong. Innocent. Men couldn't find fault with the Lord Jesus. God could not find fault with the Lord Jesus. There's a story about a prank that was played by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, you know, the author of the Sherlock yeah. Holmes yeah. stories. He wrote an anonymous letter to several members of Parliament, and it simply had these words. We are discovered, flee. The next morning, several members of Parliament had left the country. <laughs> <laughs> There are sins that everyone knows about. There are sins in your life that everyone knows about. And there are some sins that are so secret that not even the person closest to you knows about them. But God does. There is no deep crevice or corner of your heart. And there is no deep corner of the Lord Jesus' heart that the living God could not see. On the outside, the Lord Jesus looked like every other man. But on the inside, he was like no man. He was spotless, pure. No stain, no smudge, no shadow of sin. And so God could say of him, this is my son, my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. And he could declare through his unbreakable word, through the apostle Peter and John, and through the prophecy of Isaiah, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth, and the greatest evidence of all, he imputed my sin to Christ and crushed him at Calvary. How does the cross prove the Lord Jesus' innocence? Because if there was one drop, one half a drop of sin in the Lord Jesus, if there was one little secret sin, festering in some deep crevice of his heart <coughs> that no man knew about, God would know. And he already would have judged him in the category of sinner. And he would be no more able to deal with my sin or your sin than you are. But God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. The second thing I want you to see is that the cross solves our greatest problem. You take those words then. God made him who had no sin to be sin. God made him. You see, our biggest problem is not how can we be reconciled to God, but how can God be reconciled to us? God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. Our God is a consuming fire. Every day he is angry at sinners. And so if you and I shudder at what we hear on the news, how does a holy God react? He doesn't smile and shrug at domestic abuse, or at sex trafficking, or at terrorism. He doesn't laugh at movie stars taking advantage of little girls or the extermination of entire people groups because they're not the right race. All of these horrors of sin move heaven to holy anger. And as terrifying as that is, we wouldn't have it any other way, would we? Amen. Could we worship a God who was not moved by these things, who carelessly could clear the guilty and say, come on, come on, you Christ-hating, unrepentant sinners come into my heaven and love your sin for all eternity no god is a god of justice what we sow we reap we sin and we pay the wages for sin and so this is our great problem 
We may not have committed those great sins that make the headlines. But we have sinful natures. And we still break God's law every day. Now can God be reconciled to you? When you have lived the way that you've lived? There's not a single one of us who wouldn't be terrified to have a video of us at our worst and lowest and most embarrassing moments played before us. Yet God's seen. God knows. How could a living, how could a holy, just God be reconciled to sinners like that? It's impossible, surely. Well, no. It's made entirely possible at Calvary. The cross is God's great solution to our greatest problem. It announces that our sins have been laid on the Lord Jesus. And God has punished him in my place. God was enacting his justice and his judgment. Not on me, but on Christ. And so this is the greatest and the most important fact that you could ever hear in your life. That 2,000 years ago, on a rubbish dump in the Middle East, God the Father poured out his wrath and fury and judgment at your sin and my sin on the son that he had loved for all eternity. He turned his back on that son. He didn't do it because he had to. God was not obligated to punish Jesus. He was obligated to punish sin, but not his son. He was motivated by pure love for sinners. Grace and love, like mighty rivers, poured incessant from above as the wrath of God burned furiously against his son. At the same time, his love flowed rampantly to us and opened the way to reconciliation. The third thing that you must see tonight is that the cross insists on total forgiveness. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. Many people misunderstand how completely God dealt with our sin in the Lord Jesus. They ask questions like, how do I know that all of my sins we're taken care of. I'm a big sinner. How do I know there's enough grace there to cover me? Or if I believe in the Lord Jesus and then I sin, how do I know I'll be forgiven for those sins? Our verse answers all of those questions. God doesn't barter with the price of redemption. He doesn't pay part of the cost or put a deposit down and promise to pay the rest at a later date. Look at what our verse says. God made him who had no sin, to be sin for us. He made Christ sin. Now what does that mean? Well, imagine I owe Murray ten, ten dollars. Nearly said pounds though. <laughs> imagine I owe Murray ten dollars. I can cancel that debt by giving Murray ten dollars, or I could give him something that we both agree is worth ten dollars. <coughs> My sinful nature is an offence to a perfect God. And by my sins I have broken his perfect law. If you damage something that is perfect, that is pure, unadulterated, is it still perfect? It's completely ruined, isn't it? And so that crime that I've committed to get against God is a crime of infinite <coughs> value. I owe God an infinite debt, but I have nothing that is worth that much. And so I have no hope of paying God what I owe him. And just as a debtor who can't afford to pay their fine is sent to prison, so in judgment, when I come before God, I will be found short. And I will be sentenced to hell for all eternity. Eternity, infinity. But God, 
who was in no way responsible for my debt, who was under no obligation to pay it, made Christ sin. He laid my infinite sin with its infinite value on his infinite son. With his infinite value. He liquidated my debt by paying it with his son. Now if Christ is the infinite substitute for your infinite sin, how much of your sin do you think is still left to pay? How much of your sin do you think slipped by unnoticed? How much do you think went unpunished at Calvary? Which sin do you think fell out of the bottom of infinity? None of it. It's impossible. And that is terrifying. Because it means that at the, the same time in all the heartbreak of crushing his son, God was still acting meticulously. Ensuring every one of my little sins, my slips and my stray thoughts were punished in Christ. Understand this. That at the same time the mallet of God's fury was falling on his son. He is acting like an expert surgeon. And cutting out millions of tiny tumours. Ensuring each insult, each offence is paid for. So everything that Christ suffered, all of the mockery, the hammer blows, those rasping half-breaths as he suffocated on the cross. We are seeing the Son of God dealing completely with my great debt of sin. And so now everyone who is in the Lord Jesus can say with Spafford, My sin. Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin. Not in part, but the whole is nailed to his cross. And I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. The cross insists on total forgiveness. It will not have it any other way. If the Lord Jesus is infinite God, and you believe that he was made sin for you, you have nothing less than complete, utter, total forgiveness. The snow that shimmers on the top of Mount Cook looks like mud compared to your soul in Christ. Fourthly, and very briefly, the cross changes our status before God. Next time we're here, we'll think about the imputation of Christ's righteousness to us. That although in Adam we were put into the category of sinners deserving death in hell, in Christ you can be put into the category of righteous men and women deserving eternal glory in heaven. For now I just want you to see that Calvary is what makes that possible. In fact, the whole purpose of what happened on the cross was to provide a way for you to be made right with God. It's there in our verse. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So the next time we must still have the cross in mind. It will be wonderful to think of what we have been made what we've become in the Lord Jesus. But we must never forget what it cost him. Now as we close, I just want to apply this in three ways. First of all, if you're not a Christian and you're here this evening, Paul has four words that you need to hear and they come just before this verse. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled. Reconciled to God. There is an opportunity for you this evening. Even after years of living in ignorance and opposition to the Lord Jesus. To be made right with God. We sing a hymn that has these words. Guilty, vile 
and helpless we. Spotless Lamb of God was he. Full atonement, full rightness, at one with God. Can it be? Hallelujah. What a saviour. And we say hallelujah, what a saviour, because it is true. Full atonement has been made. But it terrifies me that full atonement has been made. And yet some of you are still headed for hell. That God could have done all of this. Could have taken his spotless son. And laid your filthy sins on him. And still no love for Jesus. No interest. No repentance. That this gate could have been opened at Calvary for you to escape death. But still you sit there. Indifferent, not caring about the horror of God's wrath that is laid up for you. Unmoved by Christ's love for you. Don't harden your heart anymore. Come, repent, pray now, right where you're sitting. Pray that God will give you faith to believe what you've heard this evening. That the Lord Jesus is standing right now, willing to take all your sin upon himself and suffer the hell you deserve. Two questions for those of you who are Christians. Are you satisfied with Calvary? Or do you still fall into the trap of trying to earn your salvation? When the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, where do you go? Do you try and pull yourself up? You try and dust yourself down and push yourself to new levels of commitment. When you're brought low by your guilt, do you try and make up for it? More Bible reading, more prayer, more church attendance, more evangelism. All of those things are excellent responses to the work of Christ at Calvary. But they are terrible replacements for the work of Christ at Calvary. Trying to soothe your conscience with anything but the cross. It's like trying to go swimming in lead togs. It's preposterous. How long before that Bible reading slips out of habit again? And you're back to the start. There is only one place that you can go when your sin makes you sad. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. There is one for you. Even tonight, he says, you come to me, my burden is easy, my yoke is light, oh, so easy, Christ has done it all. You must see again that Christ has drained the cup of God's wrath to its dregs. There is not one drop of its deadly poison left for you, Christian. You cannot possibly be more free or more guiltless before God. If you are in Christ. Final question. I'm going to change it. It's not going to be a question. It's a command. Take time. To dwell. On your debt. To the Lord Jesus. And it's a command to me. As much as it is to anyone else. You know as I was preparing. I was struck by how little I really understand of what happened at Calvary. How someone who has never known, how can someone like me who has never known a day without sin really understand the spotlessness and sinlessness of Christ? How can I, whose best moments are tainted with sin, how can I understand the depth of the justice and love of God imputing my sins to His Son and crushing Him in my place? I can't do it. Even the idea of infinity, I can't get my head around. But I do know something. I know that I owe everything that I am to my Saviour. Robert Murray McShane, Scottish pastor, very well loved. He was three years older than me when he died. He wrote these words in a hymn. When I stand before the throne, Dressed in beauty, 
not my own. When I see you as you are, love you with a sinless heart, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. In this life we look at the Lord Jesus through a glass, darkly, as if through a veil. But one day we will see our Saviour face to face, in all his holy purity. And you will understand then what it meant for the spotless, sinless Lamb of God to become our wretched, stinking sin. And you will know how much you owe. We will see how much you owe. And there will be many Christians there who will wish that they had given more for the Lord Jesus in this life. Are you going to be one of them? You know, there's never been a Christian who said, Oh, I wish I hadn't spent so much time reading my Bible. I wish I hadn't spent so much time in church. I wish I hadn't spent so much time sharing my faith. Never. You pray the last line of Murray McShane's hymn with me. He says, Teach me, Lord, on earth to show by my love how much I owe. Make, it, I make that your prayer. Let's pray now. <coughs> Father, these things are too lofty for us. We plumb them, dive into them, rejoice in them all the days of our life, and still we've scratched the surface of what you did at Calvary. And yet we thank you that you've made some things known to us. We thank you that this is for me, that I can say personally, with joy in my heart, oh, the love that drew salvation's plan, that it should include even me. And I can say I owe everything to my Saviour. Mm. Father, we pray then that the truth of what happened at Calvary would drive us and inspire us to deeper commitment, greater love for the Lord Jesus and his people and the lost. Father, we pray that you would use children like us to your great glory, even in Windham. We pray it in our Saviour's name. Amen.